monthly open mic session where we'll be um, chatting through and the topic for today is um, life-threatening chest pain, which will be, uh, I think it's something that we see a lot of, um, some potentially most of the time not diagnosed, sometimes diagnosed late, um, and uh, sometimes, Yes, most of the time we do not necessarily have the resources to diagnose um, the chest pain. Um, so this is one of the things we wanted to have a discussion today about um, saying how best um, to diagnose um, chest pain. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. Benjamin Washira. I'm an emergency physician at the Aga Khan University Hospital. Uh, also with the Emergency Medicine Kenya Foundation. Um, joining in will be Prof. Ian Klassens, uh, based in Monaco, also an emergency physician. Uh, he was just setting out his uh, computer, but should be able to join us shortly. Um, and uh, essentially, the idea behind our sessions, it's more of an open mic discussion um and uh, allowing people to comment give us give their perspectives um and uh, give uh tell us essentially um what they're seeing on the ground and we walk through this whole discussion to a point where we are comfortable in the approach and making the diagnosis of life threatening chest pain uh with me uh behind the scenes we have uh, Profian, I see Profian, you're connected. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Sorry, I have some troubles with my video, but it will be uh, fixed in a few instant, I, I hope. So my name is Yannick Lassens. I'm an emergency physician, and I've been uh, working with uh, Ben for a couple of months now to prepare this, uh, uh, this evening uh, uh, web conference. I'm working uh, on biomarkers in emergency medicine for now more than 20 years. And I've been specifically involved in developing algorithm and uh, well, uh, how to manage as well as possible our patients uh, using these tools. Uh, well, developing a strategy to know what limits uh, we have to to, uh, to know about them, what are, what are their strains, and where do we have to change our uh, strategy when biomarkers are not efficient enough. So I'm very pleased to be with you tonight and to share uh, my experience and, uh, with, with yours because uh, it has to be as interactive as possible to make it uh, interesting. So thank you, Ben, for the invitation. And thank right. you also to uh, all the Biomerio team that helped us to, uh, to, uh, to build this conference. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. All right. I think uh, behind the scenes, we have also a team from Biomerio that will be coming in on board later to tell us about uh, their devices. But I think we probably want to start off by figuring out um, what are we seeing on the ground? I mean, um, what would you consider life-threatening chest pain? Um, you can potentially type on the chat or put your hand up and I'll allow you to unmute yourself. Um, as what, what are your considerations when you say patient has life-threatening chest pain? Uh, either you put your hand up or just chat on the side and we see um, what we have. Because I know when I was in training, most of the chest pain was either TB or pneumonia. Question is, is TB or pneumonia life-threatening chest pain? Any comments from you guys before we kick off? You, um, you can put up your hand and I'll allow you to unmute yourself or you can just go ahead and type on the chat box what you consider life-threatening chest pain. Uh, what are the conditions that make you worry about life-threatening chest pain? Put up your hand on the mic. I can see someone putting up his hand like this. Put up your hand <laughs> on the chat. Okay, uh, Jotham, since I've seen you, all right, Jotham, um, you can unmute yourself. Tell us what you think life and chest pain is. I, I think it's chest pain. Uh, is there any patient who presents with chest pain with other uh, symptoms like vomiting, uh, acute chest pain, diaphoresis, 
um, you know, you can see we have people with chest pain who have an obvious brand injury to their chest. Yeah, those are life threatening chest pain. No. Okay, so uh, from Jotham's perspective, um, it's patients who uh, present with um, vomiting or post traumatic chest pain. Uh, anyone else with a different perspective? What are you seeing? What are patients who you would consider to have life threatening chest pain? I see someone, George, let's say the chest pain associated with shortness of breath. Okay. Uh, ACS, Brenda, you may need to elaborate what ACS is. I'm guessing acute coronary syndrome. All right. But so between jaw thumbs, vomiting, chest pain, we have left sided chest pain, actually, shortness of breath would be considered life threatening pain. ACS, Brenda, I'm not sure patients come in complaining of I have ACS. So, which of these patients presenting, which conditions? And we'll go into the different discussions um, about what are the potential life threatening causes of chest pain. Um, anyone else wants to comment on that? Uh, life threatening cause of chest pain okay um so let me just share my screen here and we can look crashing chest pain i share the feeling of impending danger all right uh prof classens what do you think of this discussion so far um well it's a, yeah it's a very uh wild discussion uh the difficulties for us is that uh these symptoms and signs are so specific say, that it is very difficult to make a proper diagnosis with only uh, well our hands and we need some other tools to help uh, of course there is uh, our experience that helps but when you take uh, big data uh, uh, that are gathering uh, signs and symptoms of people that have acute uh, myocardial injury, uh, acute coronary syndrome, uh, pneumonia. Well, patients that come to the to to the door uh, with chest pain, uh, it is very difficult to make a diagnosis. And even uh, the characteristic of the chest pain are not very helpful to make a diagnosis. For instance. Uh, the sign, the characteristic of the chest pain, which is uh, supposed to be the more specific for acute coronary syndrome, is pain into both elbows. So, in you, both elbows and shoulder uh, on both sides is a more uh, specific sign for acute coronary syndrome. In my life, I believe that I've seen only two patients like that, that had uh, acute, very sharp pain into both uh, elbows and shoulders, and that had uh, coronary, acute coronary syndrome. And on the other side, uh, when you press on the chest and it reproduces uh, the pain, uh, well, everyone believes that it is a, a sign that decreases and that maybe uh, rule out the risk for an acute coronary syndrome. In fact, it uh, decreases by three uh, the risk uh, of uh, uh, cor acute coronary syndrome. So the signs and symptoms of chest pain, the characteristics, are very difficult to integrate and we have uh, a lot of difficulties to make a proper diagnosis only based on uh, this symptom. All right. so, Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, maybe I just want to cut you off a bit, Prof, so that we go step by step. And I think you've, it's very good that you brought in the concept of it's hard to make, because for me, this is what I normally think about. When we, and I'm talking about life-threatening causes of chest pain, we have six of them, okay? So uh, we have attention pneumothorax, we have an aortic dissection, we have cardiac tamponade, we have ACS, which is what Prof. Classens was diving into. Uh, we have esophageal rupture, okay? And we have pulmonary embolus. So when, we, when I think about patient who comes in with chest pain to the ED, um, my immediate thoughts is which of these six is the, is the patient having? Because if I can rule out any of these six, if, if I rule out these six, then whatever the causes of chest pain may not necessarily lead my patients to their grave in the next couple of minutes to hours to days. So it's pretty much, I think about it in a dichotomy kind of way before even we go down to the ACS perspective of patient has come in with chest pain. All right. So are you going to die today? Or the chances of you dying are pretty much down the line. And so if you're gonna, if there's a possibility of you dying today, then which of 
this six will kill you today, okay? And, uh, um, and we'll go through quickly your clinical examination, intention, pneumothorax, your dissection, cardiac tamponade, ACS, esophageal rupture, pulmonary embolus. And each of these comes in with a different presentation. And um, so at the back of your mind, um, and uh, as for you guys who are discussing this, is this is one of the things you should always be thinking about as life in terms of chest pain. And of course, some are easy to come across with. In terms of tension in pneumothorax, either there's history of trauma, your skull test, there's differential air entry, um, things like um, the others actually become trickier. Pulmonary aortic dissection, a bit of a history of central chest pain radiating, uh, different pulses and things like that. Um, so while this talk today is not really going to go through all these six, I think one of the key things, and to be honest, the most common we see in the emergency department is probably your acute myocardial infarction angina and the pulmonary embolus, uh, way more common than most of these other ones. Um, and that will be potentially the focus of um, the discussions today. And I see most of you have picked it up uh, from the chat perspective, and I'm seeing guys saying, everyone has quickly narrowed down, oh, chest, someone, I see Nancy saying it's something, chest pain feel like something stepping on the chest. Men with severe, uh, she actually got men with severe epigastric pain relating to the chest and relieved by PPIs, uh -huh, which I think I'd ask uh, Prof to comment on. So we are talking now ACS, okay? So we're not talking about all these other six. We'll quickly just go through ACS, and then down the line discuss pulmonary embolism. So now Prof was talking, telling us about the symptomatology of ACS. And I think this is what you are telling us about in terms of, so this is what is known, chest pain, arm, jaw, neck, back, upper abdomen, um, and or crashing kind of chest pain. But Prof, from your comment, you're saying this is not something you see commonly. Well, uh, there are uh, two kinds of uh, pain with uh, acute chest pain. There is the typical chest pain, uh, which is the pressure on the chest with the radiation on both arms that everyone knows. But we all know that uh, this is not so common. And most of our patients now, especially the older patients and women, have definitely uh, other uh, signs and symptoms caused atypical chest pain. And this is gastric pain, uh, sharp pain, which is not a pressure, uh, only the radiation. And those now are more uh, frequently in, encountered uh, at bedside than the typical chest pains that we are uh, supposed to, uh, to teach uh, at, uh, at our students because reality is different. Yeah, and I think maybe we can, I mean, from the participants, anyone, I mean, most of you, have you seen a heart attack? Let's just go for the basics. Are you seeing heart attacks in your emergency department? My interest clearly would be mostly maybe if you're working in a public sector perspective. Uh, again, you can either chat and maybe tell us about the patient you saw who ended up being having a heart attack, what presentation, other than chest pain, oh, yes. what presentations are you seeing? Again, remember, you can put up your hand on the app and we'll be able to see you, or you can uh, pretty much chat and we'll be able to unmute you and get some comments from you. Um, are you seeing chest pain? Uh, are you seeing patients who are ending up having a heart attack? And how do they present in your setting? Because one of the things I'd like to ask to understand is, again, most of the studies that we have on chest pain are from Western world. Are we seeing anything different? Um, is it the same kind of presentations in our setting? Um, opening comments, discussion from um, the people, the audience. Again, either put up your hand or just um, comment on the chat and we'll be able to pick it up. Because um, anyone with a comment on this? So what Prof was talking about, the typical causes of chest pain, and what we are seeing at the bottom here, the shortness of breath, cool, clammy skin, nausea, lightheadedness. Uh, I'm seeing Anne Kaikaranja saying patient was diaphoretic and shortness of breath. That's a good one. Again, so no chest pain, but just diaphoretic and shortness of breath. Um, and let's see. 
Anne, would you want? Let's see if I can get you. Anne, maybe you want to tell us about your patient? Uh, you are allowed to unmute yourself. Okay, the patient presented chest pain. Mm -hmm. uh, the patient presented with chest pain. Yes. He was saying that the pain was uh, uh, sort of something had been placed on his chest. Okay. Of the diaphoretic and also head shortness of breath. Uh, while speaking, maybe he could only have one, two words. He could not speak a sentence. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, thanks, Anne. Um, I see also uh, Kahoro Jotham. I'd be very interested to hear about your patient who presented with abdominal pain. Um, you can unmute yourself, Kahoro. Okay, so Kahoro, you're saying your patient presented with severe abdominal pain. Go ahead. Yeah, this was a diabetic patient who came up with upper severe abdominal pain. And yeah, ended up so being a heart attack? Yes, yes. Oh, interesting. All right. Um, Dian, yes, yes well, comment. Yes, that is very interesting because, you know, uh, exactly our patients with diabetes have uh, neurological uh, abnormalities and perception of the pain is different and sometimes you only have these radiations that are abdominal radiations and sometimes only the shoulder radiation but abdominal pain in this in those patients is quite uh, usual and a very interesting sign is that now uh, you have to thought about uh, chest pain when you have a uh, a pain into the, the stomach and uh, if you have an acute pain that you can't explain uh, by an abdominal uh, problem you have to make an EKG but G, that, that would be next step of the discussion uh, you will you have to to find out if your patient do not have a cardiac uh, problem uh, or a heart problem and maybe a chest problem and this is a quite uh, quite uh, usual radiation Thanks. And uh, the image you're seeing on the screen right now, as you can see, pretty much before we used to be so left sided chest pain and you think you had a heart attack. But as you can see, these are the, all the potential areas your patient could present with pain. So it's not just chest pain, especially. So, and the key thing here is to always think about the patient to the risk factors, the risk factors being your age, your diabetes, hypertension. Uh, smoking, family history of heart disease. So that patient who comes in with uh, either central chest pain, radiating the neck, jaw, left arm, right arm, to the back, interscapular. I'm seeing some people say a uh, patient presented with pain between the scapula and severe epigastric pain. Um, so the clinical presentation is not just the traditional left-sided chest pain. And rarely have we ever seen a patient present like this gentleman on the screen here. Most of them will come with potentially some indigestion, some neck pain. Um, some pain in the right side of the chest. It's not just always the left side of the chest. Um, and now, based on the fact that a lot of these patients uh, present, um, I mean, we get chest pain in the ED for many reasons. And in the emergency department, patients will present with chest pain, shoulder pain, arm pain, uh, pain down one arm because of very many factors. So as a person, as one, as a clinician working on the front line, then your index of suspicion becomes your first um, pretty much tool. So that patient who unexplained chest pain or diaphoretic, shortness of breath, a patient who, for example, is non-diabetic, no hypertensive, is an elderly gentleman, male, female. And elderly, by the way, does not mean 60. I've seen 30-year-olds with heart attacks. So it's not just an elderly patient. It's just patients who you have that index of suspicion. and. So this is our chest pain algorithm. Um, so just going, just coming down to where we start from. And as you can see, the algorithms, the algorithms are available on our website. Um, but as you can see from the top, we start clearly from chest discomfort. We don't even call it pain, suggestive of ischemia. And this goes down to a whole list of things. So you have what we call anginal equivalence, uh, which are typical symptoms, exceptional chest pain, exceptional pain in the ear, jaw, neck, shoulder, arm, back, so pretty much everywhere. Uh, exceptional dyspnea, nausea, vomiting are good things to quickly pick up. And also um, 
deference and fatigue. So maybe we can go down the algorithm and say, so you have this patient, they've quickly been triaged by the nurse in the emergency department, and uh, maybe back to Prof. Klassen. So after triage, what are, I mean, what are our priorities and why? Mm. So, oh, I have a last hand on my side. Um, so, uh, when you have a triage, a patient with an ECG that shows uh, ST elevation, it's done. So an ECG, so the priority is an ECG. Yes, exactly. And this is the first step of the algorithm that you, you should have, is to make a diagnosis of ST elevation patients, which is finally a situation that requires uh, immediately the cath lab. Uh, the cath lab or trouble is depending on your resources. If your resources is an immediate uh, uh, cath lab, if it's possible in your institution, you have to do that. Uh, if it's not possible, you have to open uh, the coronary artery, and for that, you have thrombolysis. But okay. if, so, so ECG, this is the first step. Yeah, so the ECG is the first step. Now, the question is, because um, one of the things that is a big problem, I know in many public hospitals, one of the projects we've been doing is people just do not have an ECG. Now, the question, uh, maybe, uh, yes, class, uh, your other classes, your video is up. Yes, so... Well, um, you know, it's, it's up in, on another computer. No so problem. I was dealing with both computers. I'm sorry for that. Not a problem. All right, now, now you're, you're, you're at home. Now we yes. all know how you look like. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, so ECG, and that's one of the things that you need an ECG. Okay, so and yeah. there are a couple of things. Maybe let me throw this back to the panelist. Uh, to know the panelist to the audience, what is the importance of an ECG? Why do you need an ECG, and why should this ECG be done within ten minutes? So, last triage the patient. Highly suspects the patient may have a, a heart attack from the clinical presentation at triage. Why is an ECG important, and why? should it be done within 10 minutes? Maybe before we go to Prof, um, what do you guys think? What's the importance of an ECG? I'd like to hear um, your perspectives on this. Um, if you have one, tell us you have an ECG in your department. If no, then maybe you should get one, but also tell us the challenges you face because of not having an ECG machine. All right, either put up your hand or just uh, chat. On the side, we'll be able to see the chat. Anyone wants to tell us about why is an ECG important within 10 minutes? Um, okay. Any? Ah, uh, yes, Kevin. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Maybe tell us why do you think an ECG is important? Kevin, let tape. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, an ECG yes. is, uh, is important because uh, it can show evidence of previous uh, heart attack mm -hmm. and also it provides information about the heart rates and the rhythm. Okay, which is good. Yeah. So it tells you about the condition of the heart. Um, anyone know, so in terms of a patient with one of these life-threatening chest pain, especially here we're talking about a patient where you suspect a heart attack. What's the, thanks Kevin for that. Um, what's, what's the benefit of an ECG? I see Lydia saying ECG is diagnostic. Uh, she has one in her clinic. Um, diagnostic of what? Maybe Lydia, um, uh, if I could, yes, you can unmute yourself. So you're saying ECG is diagnostic. Um, diagnostic of? Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe, yes. maybe Ben, I can just. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Go oh, ahead, Lydia. Good evening. Evening. Yeah. My name is Lydia. I'm a nurse in one of the outreach clinics for Aga Khan. Yes. Uh, I'm saying it's diagnostic because you're able to know if a patient presents with a very fast heart rate, so you're able to pick if there's a 
supraventricular tachycardia okay. or if a patient has a rhythm problem. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you very much, Lydia. I'll take the last comment from Nancy, then Prof. Classens can continue. Nancy, you can unmute yourself. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, we have an ECG. I work in MTRH Eldoret. Yes. Uh, I think the best, the, uh, why we need an ECG within the 10 minutes. Yes. It's because we want to prevent this injury. Yeah. From progressing to an infarct. Yes. Yes, that is, what, that is what I think we need to, an ECG within 10 minutes to prevent that injury from progressing. We pick the prob, we pick the injury, then mm -hmm. we, we prevent with, before it goes to an MI, an infarct. All right, good. All right, thank you very much, Nancy. Prof, why do we yes. have an ECG in 10 minutes? Nancy is absolutely right, and what she has said illustrates uh, what is said usually is time is muscle for a uh, uh, patient uh, with an acute coronary syndrome with ST elevation, you should have the diagnosis as soon as possible because as soon you can treat the patient properly, uh, thrombolysis or cath, or cath lab, if you have a cath lab, uh, you can have uh, the, the right treatment and you can uh, uh, allow to the patient to have a new, once again, a normal uh, vascularization of the heart and you don't lose your heart because the problem is, of course, the heart attack, but afterwards it is the consequences of the heart attack, which is uh, heart failure. And most patients that develop heart failure after, uh, afterward are patients with unknown or undiagnosed or untreated uh, uh, heart attack. All right. Thanks, Prof. Yeah. So the ECG, I mean, all the things that the people have commented about, about is very important. And ECG is important for picking up heart abnormalities, different heart rhythms, um, trying to figure out whether the patient has an SVT, doesn't have an SVT. Now, from the perspective solely, this is the perspective solely of ACS, okay? In terms of diagnosing a heart attack, there are only two questions. So when I get, uh, so in our department, um, I have very fancy nurses. They'll do the ECG before anyone asks for it, which is good. So at triage, the nurse will do the triage and quickly do the ECG. And there's only one question I want answered. Is this a STEMI or not a STEMI? Okay. Now, the difference and uh, the ECGs you're seeing on the screen, um, so ST elevation, that's what I'm pointing at, is your ST elevation. And there are very many variables of it, uh, which may, I may not be able to go into details on the Algorithms is a bit more details on what a STEMI is, but the main thing when I'm getting an ECG from a nurse who's telling me a patient has come in, they're complaining of chest pain, jaw pain, whatever, I get an ECG, and the ECG, it's either do I have a STEMI or not a STEMI. Note, I'm not saying does this patient have a heart attack or not, and that's something that people need to be very clear about. An ECG does not rule out a heart attack. An ECG only tells you whether it's this ST elevation myocardial infarction or not ST elevation myocardial infarction. And when it's not, there's many other causes, there's many other heart attacks the patient could be having about, uh, could be having. But the key thing about getting the ECG in 10 minutes is does this patient have a STEMI? Okay, and with a STEMI, because as what Nancy has said and Prof has said is, Time is heart muscle. So patients who have STEMI need to be treated now. They need to be treated as soon as possible. There are timelines, they need to go for PCA, they need to go to a cast lab. And for them, their treatment is instantaneous. So triage is done. Within 10 minutes, I get an ECG. An ECG is, um, shows me ST elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, that patient is getting their treatment now. I don't need to do any more tests on them, uh, at least not to manage them. I don't need to do anything fancy for them. They go straight to the cath lab. They go straight to for thrombolysis if I'm not taking them to the cath lab. And in Nairobi, we don't have that many cath labs or thrombolysis. 
Um, and maybe we can pick this quick discussion before, because the STEMI patients are the best. STEMI patients treatment is instantaneous. Nothing to worry, uh, no additional testing required, not much, it's just take them to cath lab, take them from thrombolysis. Um, I think I want to quickly close on the STEMI because the not STEMI group who are still potentially having a heart attack are the ones who tend to be missed and are the ones who then further testing and further evaluation is required still not to miss a heart attack. Um, in terms of cath labs, uh, maybe again, back to the team, to the chat. Um, I don't know, maybe before I go there, Prof. Klassen, what's yes. your to cath lab timelines in your setting? Well, uh, it's very, very short, but we, I live in a very special uh, area. However, in France, uh, in big town, uh, usually, you have the cath lab within uh, 60 to 90 minutes, which is uh, the limit. And, and in, in many areas, you don't have this delay because, uh, you know, France is also a country where uh, uh, big centers concentrate all the resources and all the remaining of the land has nearly nothing but something to make a diagnosis, not to make the treatment. So thrombolysis is quite usual. Uh, in Monaco, it's very different, you know. Uh, it's a short place, everything is concentrated. But what I wanted to comment is about treatment. Even though you don't have a cath lab, even though you don't have thrombolysis, you have to, to think about one thing, the medication uh, that has been the more efficient to decrease uh, mortality in acute coronary syndrome is aspirin. And in 1997, a big paper showed that giving aspirin uh, at the uh, acute phase of uh, acute coronary syndrome of myocardial infarction decreases by 30% mortality and morbidity. So first of all, aspirin. Good. That's a very good point because as I go into this discussion, I think we all may not have ECGs, we all may not have thrombolysis, cath labs are non-existent in the majority of the country, but I don't. I think everyone has aspirin and how much aspirin, uh, Prof, are we talking about? How much aspirin are we asking to get the patient? Well, depending on the results of uh, the studies, uh, the best concentration, well, the best dose regimen for the first uh, administration should be uh, uh, 250 milligram. Uh, it can be a little bit less from 100 to a little bit more, 1500. So, okay. but, but well, but the threshold, the cutoff, the median should be 250 milligram. Yeah, so it's once it's 225, uh, which is kind of what we also give in our setting. But for you people, I just want to go and get the um, from the audience. Um, are you picking up STEMIs? Are you thrombolizing them? Are you taking them to cath labs? If thrombol, if you're using, if you're doing thrombolysis, what are you using? Uh, again, just either chat on the side, put up your hand, and would like to hear what is actually going on on the ground for this kind of patients with chest pain. So feel free to just put up your hand um, or chat on the side. Is are you thrombolizing your patients? Are you taking? Do you have access to a cath lab? Um, or what exactly are you doing with these groups of patients? Uh, I work in a facility. In fact, um, I was listening to Prof. Ian saying their door to cast lab is 60 to 90. I think from our last data, we've been able to narrow it down to almost 20 to 30 minutes door to cast lab. Um, it's because the whole system has been optimized. Um, so ECG is done at triage. Uh, the moment I see STEMI on the ECG, the cardiologist is already called on the phone we are going to cath lab. There's nothing else we're doing in the ED. We are heading straight. So our dot cath lab is pretty much most of the time less than 30 minutes. And uh, we are doing less and less thrombolysis, but I work in a fancy area. Um, anyone out there wants to tell us, are they saying STEMIs? Where are they referring them to? Uh, or are you giving them any treatment? Uh, again, feel free to put up your hand um, and make a comment. Um, and I think one of the things uh, we can look at, so as I say, the ECGs, 
the main thing is to pick up a STEMI. Um, and there are different ECG patterns. So this is one set of ECG patterns. And uh, there are multiple, so deep inverted T waves. But that, that is a STEMI. That is what we're normally looking out for in most of our ECGs. And uh, with that, then we're looking at and some of the more fancy, complicated. Um, and as I mentioned, the diagnosis is STEMI or not STEMI. Not STEMI is two different categories, and I will go deeper into this discussion. And that's what we want to probably dive into because ECG tells me STEMI, not STEMI. Now, not STEMI means your patient is still having a heart attack. They don't need to go to cath lab just now. Um, I don't need to thrombolize them. Um, uh, so I need to figure out what is going on. I still see, I don't see much in terms of comments. So maybe, Prof, we can slowly start tracking down into, I've done an ECG, my patient doesn't have a STEMI, so I'm not taking them to cath lab. I'm not taking them to, um, I'm not giving them any thrombolysis doesn't mean they do not have a heart attack, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, I still think my patient has a heart attack, so now what? Okay, so the epidemiology told us that uh, it's quite uh, uneasy to make the diagnosis of uh, acute coronary syndrome. Five to 10% of patients with chest pain will have a heart attack with ST elevation on the ECG, so quite an easy diagnosis. but uh the reality is that uh about twice uh patient with uh, acute coronary syndrome uh, have a heart attack without any abnormality well without a st elevation on the uh, on the uh, electrocardiogram that means that five to ten percent have a heart attack with st elevation 10 to 15 percent have a heart attack without st elevation so uh we have to to know that uh, because uh, those patients will have the same prognosis if we don't make the diagnosis. Okay, so you're saying 10 to 15% of patients will not be picked up by my ECG. So my ECG will not show me 10 to 15% of heart attacks. Exactly, and uh, we have to uh, keep in mind that there is heart attack and there are all the other diagnoses, especially pulmonary embolism, uh, heart dissections, etc. Other diagnoses that are not diagnosed with the ECG. So ECG is the first step. Uh, if it's positive for ST elevation, we know what to do. We've discussed that. If it's negative, what to do next? Okay, so... Um... All right, so how do I pick up? So let me, because uh, I want to know now, how do I identify? So yes, there's all the other life threatening causes of chest pain, which uh, we will in, uh, investigate accordingly based to your patient presentation. But how do we pick up this? Because the main thing now is troponin, pretty much. And um, from your patient's chest pain, the next test, which everyone orders, and I think I work in a center where I think every human being gets a troponin, sometimes, unnecessarily but um, that's a different discussion altogether um, what is troponin and what's the, how does no. troponin help me pick up this 10 to 15 percent mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the first uh, time there was a, a proof for a clinical uh, benefit to make the uh, troponin test was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was about 20 years ago. It was a German study that showed that in patients with uh, chest pain and unconclusive uh, electrocardiogram, uh, you can make a diagnosis of acute myocardial injury of uh, heart attack making a test that was uh, a test with uh, a qualitative test of troponin that showed that it was positive or negative. And uh, in this uh, study, uh, the authors uh, made kinetics because if the chest pain was very early, they had in mind that maybe troponin was not increased and maybe they had to wait a little bit before uh, there is an increase of the biomarker. Uh, 
the problem is that uh, with this first uh, generation troponin, uh, it was very difficult to make the diagnosis for every patient, especially uh, in this study, 10% of patients with acute myocardial injury uh, with a heart attack were not diagnosed with uh, the, uh, the first uh, generation troponin. So at that time, uh, there was a, clearly a need for more sensitive, more specific, well, not more specific, but more sensitive uh, assays that will uh, detect lower concentration of the biomarker. Right. Uh, I'm trying so, to, to yeah. share with you uh, my screen. Yes, you should be able to. Well, I'm going to try on the other. Uh, I have two Mac. You know, <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> All right. So as yeah. Prof, yeah, as Prof sets himself up, I think one of the things. I mean, troponin. Uh, he's just mentioned it's a biomarker. So from my understanding, and essentially where troponin comes from is your um, the pathophysiology or what happens when you're having a heart attack is there's decreased blood flow, there's a blockage of one of your arteries that supplies blood to your heart muscle. So your heart muscles then start pretty much dying because, and that's why we all say time is heart muscle because your heart muscles are starting to die. Now, as your heart muscle dies, it starts releasing chemicals. Um, and it's these chemicals that we're talking, we are um, calling the biomarkers, these chemicals which show up in your blood, there's a, most of, there's a lot of them, there's CKMB, there's troponin C, troponin I, troponin T, um, and for the patient who the ACG did not show me a STEMI, then the next place I want to look at is test the blood and see, can I detect any of these biomarkers that may be um, specific um, or sensitive enough um, uh, to detect if your patient is having a heart attack. And um, Prof, I, uh, maybe I see some comments on the side. So Simon Nanga troponin is the most sensitive cardiac marker. Um, well, uh, it is, yes. yes. Uh, is it sensitive? Is it specific? Uh, well, it is, well, it has become both, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, today, uh, the most specific biomarker, the most specific marker, uh, which is uh, a test into the blood, as you just uh, said, uh, is the level of troponin that you can measure into the blood. And of course, when there is a myocardial infarction, uh, it takes time for the troponin to grow, to increase, and to be detected. How much time? So, well, uh, with the uh, qualitative assays that I was talking about uh, and that were the very f uh, described, it was uh, six hours before you have the test. Okay. Maybe you can uh, see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen now. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. And so that was a 1997 uh, uh, paper, but there was two papers in the same issue of the New England in uh, 2009 that showed that uh, as early as three hours with more sensitive tests, you are able to make the diagnosis. So with the new tests that are very specific, you can make the diagnosis of uh, acute coronary syndrome within a very short lifetime. If the first uh, concentration is not elevated, you have to make a new test one hour, two hours, or three hours later, depending on your strategy, uh, to make the diagnosis. So, uh, very specific. Prof, just some very clarification specific, on that one. Very, very specific. Yes. Very sensitive. Yes, thanks. Uh, just on a clarification, because I need um, us to discuss, like, so if I started having chest pain now, preferably I don't. Um, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, if I go right now, I'm having chest pain, starts now, and then go to the emergency department and they draw my blood samples for a troponin test. Will it be positive? Well, it will depend on uh, how long time uh, you have between uh, chest pain onset. 10 and, minutes. Uh, so I have 10 minutes. It will take me 15 minutes right now from my house to the emergency department. So I'll be there in 15 minutes from the onset of my chest pain. Will my troponin be positive? Well, no way. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, because it takes some time, of course. It is a physiological, uh, a pathophysiological uh, process. So uh, it takes some time uh, to increase and it takes about three hours to be detected. Okay. So between the very beginning of uh, the pain and the positivity, well, generally you have three hours to make sure, absolutely sure, that it is positive. Okay. However, yeah. may, whereas it's come a little bit uh, uh, confusing, new algorithms are able to detect very small uh, variation of uh, the test and make the diagnosis earlier. So zero one hour and zero two hour hours uh, uh, algorithm have been developed. But the first one that was proposed uh, at bedside and was endorsed by the guidelines was a zero three hours algorithm just to make sure that uh, you were able to catch all the patients. All right, so that's good. I think that's one of the things I uh, normally have an issue with. Um, and I see a lot of issues is the patient comes in, oh, I was driving in traffic and I started getting chest pain. So I took a detour into the emergency department and the doctor orders a troponin and gets a result and says, oh, troponin is negative, go home. Yet, as mm -hmm. Prof is saying, it takes three hours for your troponin to rise. So if you do a troponin too early, you will actually miss the heart attack. Okay, and that's what I think another point um, I think Prof is also putting forward is time. So for time to ECG, 10 minutes. ECG tells you patient has a STEMI or a not a STEMI. Now for your not STEMI patients, they still are having heart attacks, but a troponin helps you pick it up. And, but again, with that, there's a time when you did the troponin. Do it too early, then you will miss the heart attack. Uh, do it at least three hours, three uh, beyond three hours, then you have a higher chance of picking it up. So maybe just on that prof, if I do a troponin, a patient's onset of symptoms has been more than four hours. Okay, so let me never just go at an extra hour. And my troponin is negative. Okay, so based on your, so there are different labs and different use, different cutoffs. So you need to correlate this with your laboratory. Um, uh, maybe, Prof, you ca can you mention on the cutoffs? Because there is some variation, different labs, and what does the cutoff mean? Well, uh, what, you, with, what we have to know is uh, different uh, companies develop different tests to those uh, different troponins. But troponins that are specific of the heart are troponin I and troponin T. I know that it is a little bit complex, a little bit uh, specific. However, we, you have to know that all the troponin are not specific. So you have to make sure that the troponin that is measured in your lab is specific uh, of, uh, of the heart. So you have to contact your uh, biologist and to discuss with him about that. About the cutoff and about the kinetics, because we talk about the cutoff, but we also have to talk about the kinetics. Uh, the cutoffs are different from a uh, company to another uh, because what is measured is different. Troponin T or troponin I with different technologies. And what is also important is, as you told just then, uh, uh, for how long time do I suffer? Uh, or was just, just chest pain onset two hours, three hours, six hours ago? If the troponin is not negative because there is very often a gray zone, if it is in the gray zone, not positive, not negative, uh, how do I deal with that? That means that there is a lower cutoff, a lower cutoff. If the troponin is below this cutoff, the patient should not have an AMI, should not have a, a bad outcome at day 30 because uh, that's what showed uh, the studies. If it is above the upper cutoff, the patient may have an acute myocardial injury. He should have uh, a cath lab. He should have investigation to make sure that he has uh, coronary artery syndrome and that he should be treated uh, for that. But there is always a gray zone between the lower cutoff and the upper cutoff. If you are in between, what to do? What to do next? 
Ah, good. And before we actually deep the grades on discussion, I see there's a question here uh, from John McCarrier. Should we do troponin T and I at the same time? You must be working in a very fancy place with two machines. <laughs> <laughs> but do, is there any, assuming you work in a facility that has two machines and does troponin T, troponin I, should you order both? Does it really make a difference? Uh, that is a very, very interesting uh, uh, question. To, to be honest, uh, uh, all these tests are quite equivalent. However, however, it has been seen that for a very, very early presenter, uh, for you, Ben, that is suffering from now only a quarter of an hour of your chest pain, but it's about now three quarter of an hour, we are talking a lot. Yes. Uh, troponin T is able, is more uh, performant to make a diagnosis for early, very early presenters. And troponin I is more efficient for a long time presenter for those that, that waited too long before uh, visiting the emergency department. So there is a tiny difference, but uh, at bedside, it makes no difference. You have to uh, make a measure of troponin T or troponin I, and if you make a kinetic, you make a kinetic with the same, the same measurement, the same uh, test, because uh, every test is, uh, every algorithm is test specific and the cutoffs are test specific. So the variation are test specific. So right. one test positive or one test in the gray zone, you have to make a second test with the same, with the same uh, uh, concentration, with the same uh, uh, product. All right. I just want to ask Dr. Sigay, because I'm seeing his type of chat here. Maybe you can tell us, you can elaborate on his question a bit. Dr. Sigay, you can unmute yourself. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, so, yeah, I just uh, was reading more about this troponin I and T, just trying to understand the differences. I came across this paper that was talking about uh, elevations in troponin I are more strongly associated with uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes. Uh, whereas T is more strongly associated with the risk of non-CBD death. So I was just putting it out there either to, to prof yourself or anyone else who wants to comment on that. Hmm. Uh, well, uh -huh. go ahead, prof. Well, to be honest, uh, it's quite equivalent, as I told, and uh, it makes no very big difference at that side. Uh, what is important is to have a test, to know how to use it, and to use it in the best way, uh, especially for very, very uh, initial diagnosis, because whatever you test you use, if you don't use it uh, well, whereas it seems to be uh, more efficient on some things, on very big cohorts, uh, it makes no difference for your own patient. So uh, know what is in your lab, know how you have to use it, discuss with your biologist uh, to choose the best algorithm in your setting. That is my advice. And finally, uh, the differences we can see in very big courts about long-term outcome, well, are not very relevant for the physician at that side. Hi, Horo Jotham, I want you to, I just need to find you on my screen with very many people in it. Like, um, cause Sukaro says we always repeat TROPS and AKGs for all patients who come to the ED. Um, just, mm -hmm. Let me just quickly get you, FG, oh. yes. Yeah, so what, uh, Jotham, okay, before Prof comments on this, Jotham, yes, you can yes, unmute yes. yourself. Tell us a bit more about this. So, um, I, I work in uh, France, a place like you, um, and um, uh, for all patients who present with, um, we usually get, uh, I'll, I'll say a type of case of a patient who comes um, to the ED or the abroad with aberrance um, with an EKG with an obvious ST elevation, and this is, um, um, they, we wheel them to the cath lab. But for patients who come with chest pain within one hour, and their troponins are negative, we do repeat the troponins with after three hours. And also, you know, every patient comes with a different, but if they continue having pain, we, we say this is serial EKGs, we repeat EKGs, because they can have even a normal EKG, and then after 15 minutes, you have an elevated ST elevation in the ECG. Mm -hmm. 
So um, it's case by case scenario, but uh, the most important is to repeat troponins after three hours if a patient present within one hour of chest pain. Mm. Ben, may I comment that? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Probably. Well, yes, you're completely right. Uh, so what we have to do is, of course, uh, 12, uh, 12 lead e ECG. And now the last uh, guidelines for, well, not the last, but uh, since a couple of guidelines, it's clear that you have to repeat EKGs, uh, but you have to make also uh, not 12 leads, but 18 leads EKG. Uh, to have also uh, the derivation uh, posterior and left uh, to, to make sure that you don't miss anything. So you have to enlarge uh, the number of leads that you record and to repeat. Uh, as, you, as we repeat, of course, uh, the EKG because uh, heart attack is a dynamic phenomenon and that initially you may have no abnormality that may appear secondarily. Uh, there is another thing that is very interesting, is that now uh, we are talking about uh, uh, two uh, repeated ECG, but in, uh, and I'm sure that it will be worldwide this way. Uh, in, a few, in a few years, probably we will have continuous uh, ECG that will tell us, be careful, the ECG of this patient is changing. So you have to be very careful about this one because uh, we know now that uh, variation of the ST segment that may be uh, very short, very short, have the same prognosis as a continuous uh, elevation at the very first phase of uh, the uh, myocardial infarction. So. We repeat the ECG today, in a few years, uh, we will have continuous ECG that will tell us because the machine would be intelligent and would give us the information. Your ST elevation is now present. Take very good care of this patient. Yes, and I think that's one of the key things. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for bringing this discussion up. And the main thing is this, it says here normal morphology does not mean your patient is not having a STEMI. Or does not mean your patient is not having a, a heart attack. ECGs, especially your patients who present early, so what you're seeing here is a continuum in terms of how the ECG develops. So you may do an ECG when the patient presents with chest pain and this is where they are. And if they continue having chest pain, you repeat it, you get a bit of a hyperacute T waves, you repeat it, you get your ST elevation. So ECG, as Prof has mentioned, is not a static measurement, especially in a patient with ongoing chest pain. It is something that is dynamic and you need to repeat it to see if there are any changes. And the changes, if you ever do an ECG on a patient, for example, with chest pain, and the first ECG and the second ECG look different, doesn't even matter what, this is where your kindergarten spot the difference kind of situation is. If there is a difference, your patient is having a problem, your patient needs to be evaluated uh, and specifically watched out for having a STEMI. Um, so ECG, repeating an ECG, in a patient with ongoing chest pain is a very strong recommendation that would be at least minimum two ECGs um, and potentially do more as the patient progresses. And your only thing you're looking for is any changes in the ECG, any dynamic changes in the ECG. All right, so the thing, just to close on this discussion around STEMI, non-STEMI, sorry, non-ST elevation MI, um, remember you have, Troponin is just one thing, and the Prof mentioned nicely about the issue of, so if, you, if you've done your troponin and you did it when a time where the patient was at least more than three hours since the onset of pain, okay, and it is positive uh, based on the upper limit that has been set by your lab, then your patient potentially has what we call a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Okay, so, Non-ST elevation myocardial infarction is you have a positive troponin, no ST elevation changes on your ECG, and um, you have the clinical symptoms. Now, if your troponin, after again done, if it was done before your three hours time frame, then you have to repeat it because you need it takes up to three hours for your troponin to start going up. Okay, so you have to repeat your troponin if you took it too early. Now. After, if your troponin is less than the lower limit set by your laboratory, 
um, and you took it at a timely money after three hours, then note does not mean your patient does not have a heart attack. I think this is something I need to also clarify. All right. So in your ECG, so as you see, we have two options for your patient. So they may be in the ST elevation MI, they may be in the non-ST elevation MI situation where they may not have the ST changes but have a troponin, but there's one category that always needs to be evaluated, which is your high-risk and stable angina patient. And this is your patient who presents with chest pain, suggestive of uh, myocardial infarction. Um, you've done your troponin within the timelines that have been set up. It showed up and it's less than uh, your cutoff, uh, your lower limit of cutoff, all right? And your patient still has symptoms. And this is the important part. You are not treating the lab, you're treating the patient. So it all boils back to the patient. So you still have to evaluate your patient. And on the algorithms, uh, especially in the non ST elevation algorithm, there is the heart score. So this is a tool that was developed specifically for use in the emergency department. And the heart essentially is an acronym because you can see H E A R T. Okay, so the heart score for chest pain patients. So this is where now you elevate, evaluate your patient, the troponin is negative, they had symptoms suggestive of a heart attack. My question is, is this patient having a heart attack or could I comfortably discharge and discharge them and they will not die? Okay, because remember, the last thing you want to do is send a patient home who then you're told they passed on uh, down the line. And the things you look at for your, on your heart score is uh, history, highly suspicious, um, or moderately suspicious, slightly suspicious, and you give a point for this. Uh, ECG changes, you have uh, significant ST depression, non-specific repolarization changes, and normal ECG, you get points for that. Your age, you get some points for that. Risk factors, so how many risk factors does your patient have? So you have your risk factors here, your diabetes, uh, current or, or recent, uh, smoke, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, family of coronary disease, obesity, and then you still have your troponin. So in this situation, your troponin has come and it's less than the normal limit. And then which point you get zero, but you still have to evaluate your patient. So it's not just troponin. So I hear a lot, oh, the patient's troponin is negative. And then what about his history? What about his DCG? What about his age? What about his risk factors? And based on your score, your total score, once you add up your points at the bottom here, you can see, uh, major adverse cardiac mess is major adverse cardiac events is what's the probability of patient dying or suffering a major heart problem in the next couple of months and uh, and the study that looked at this or that developed this you can see if your score is zero to three you have a 2.5 percent chance of getting a major adverse cardiac event in the next six weeks you can go home if your score is four to six then your risk is quite significant this is one to five one out of every five patients who score this four to six uh, will probably suffer a major adverse cardiac event for the next six weeks, and those need to be admitted for clinical observation and a cardiology look at them. And then lastly, of course, if your score is seven to 10, you probably need to have that cardiology discussion now rather than sooner rather than later uh, to discuss this further. Okay, so this again is part of the algorithm. You can have a look at it later. Um, there's a comment that Prof mentioned about troponin where you have a gray zone, where it's not above the upper limit, it's not below the lower limit. Uh, Prof, what do we do with the gray zone? Well, uh, what you are talking about is very important and uh, uh, using scores is uh, very interesting, but the big differences in these scores uh, relies on the results of uh, the biomarker. So you showed the heart scores, or other scores like the TV score, the GRACE score, whatever. You choose a heart score, which is very efficient in the setting of emergency medicine, and that's a good point. Uh, as, as you can see, maybe you can share again the, the score, Ben. Yeah, let uh, me share that, yes. Yes, there is, uh, some, you know, uh, every uh, characteristic is weighted, especially, uh, um, so history uh, and age and risk factors. Uh, what is very interesting is that uh, we know 
that uh, for people that are uh, over 70 years of age, so here the threshold is uh, 65, but for patients that are 60, 75 years old or older, uh, there are no differences for these patients in uh, risk factors. They have the same risk factors, whereas they have a chest pain with or with not an acute coronary syndrome. And the big difference in this course rely on the results of troponin. I just would like to share with you uh, uh, the result of a, a study that is a study that was uh, released uh, years ago in the JAMA by uh, a team that I love, that is uh, uh, the team from Edinburgh, uh, Christian Mills, a very good uh, guy, very pleasant, that uh, drinks a lot of beer and is very uh, good guy. And here is this paper. Uh, in this paper, what did he show? He showed that patients with very high level of, uh, of troponin, whatever you use, uh, old or a new troponin assay, uh, are detected. Those with very low concentration of troponin are detected by the, the algorithm, uh, whatever the technique the old or the new technique. But when you use uh, high sensitive troponin, you make the difference. And that is, is what is told in uh, these uh, scores. You can uh, measure small modification of troponin that will uh, stratify the risk for your patients. And here in green was the mortality of the patient in the gray zone that were not detected by the old uh, troponin, and this is uh, the mortality uh, of their patients with the new troponin. What it says, and you, what you, you have to know is that this curve is the same curve with patients with very high troponin. So patients with mild troponin uh, that is increased but not so increased uh, and without any uh, ST elevation and that are not diagnosed, they uh, die uh, exactly in the same range, in the same uh, uh, the same than, than people with ST elevation and with high concentration of troponin. So it's very, very important to have a troponin that is able to detect uh, mild amounts of uh, troponin. That makes a difference. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. I think I want to summarize this discussion uh, at this point because we need to quickly jump into the other life threatening cause of chest pain, which is your pulmonary embolus. So I think um, in summary for the chest pain patients um, where we're thinking a heart attack is get an ECG within 10 minutes, give them mass pain. Is it STEMI? Go to cath lab, thrombolize. If it's not STEMI, make sure you're doing a troponin within the appropriate time period. And if you do it too early, make sure you repeat it. You know, repeat ACG, and uh, if your troponin is positive, of course, then they need to be admitted and sorted out by cardiologist. If your troponin is negative, then you need to hard score them to make sure that they are potentially safe for discharge or get admitted. Um, and I think uh, that would be my key take-home messages, and we'll go through this again at the end. But I think one of the other things that we are discussing in this point and want to discuss in this forum is your pulmonary embolus. So heart attacks, ECG, get ECG, work them out with some troponin and figure it out. Now, the other thing that I think we miss tons of is your pulmonary embolism. And um, again, uh, feel free to put up your hand and just give us how many people, how commonly are we seeing pulmonary embolism on the ground? Uh, so feel free to comment on the chat. Tell us how much pulmonary embolism you're seeing, um, but also clinical presentation. So pretty much the same concept, presents with chest pain, with a shortness of breath. Again, this is pretty much the same um, presentation that your MI patient had. Um, now, Prof, you experience pulmonary embolism. Patient comes into the emergency department. Why yes. is pulmonary embolism? Well, uh, I'm trying to share uh, my screen, but I'm, I'm yeah, afraid that... You can do that, now. You can do now. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, I do that. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, when you have a patient uh, with chest pain... Uh, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. So, patients with chest pain, 
you have uh, this distribution. It can be acute coronary syndrome, it can be chest pain related and shortness of breath related to acute or chronic heart failure, it can be sepsis, pneumonia, it can be PE. And as you can see, PE is 15% of these patients, which is a lot. Which, which is, is more than it's more than ACS based on yes, your, it is. Yeah. Well, this is in the setting of uh, Western countries, industrial countries. So maybe it, it's a little bit different from an area to another. However, it has been for a very long time uh, considered as a diagnosis that was most missed and responsible for undue death. Mm. And I think, I mean, uh, I'm seeing any comments, anyone, again, put up your hand if you have a comment. Are you seeing pulmonary embolism or are we missing it? Um, which is potentially based on that, at least it's good to see, because I think once we said considering it in our setting as a di diagnosis, we've seen way more that we should be seeing. Uh, any comments? Nancy, you can unmute yourself. Oh. I would like to know more on nursing a patient with a pulmonary embolism. Yes. Uh, like yesterday, we had a patient mm -hmm. who came with a classical sign. She had DVT. And a patient who was around 55 years. And um, the patient was talking with me. And uh, suddenly, when we were trying to change uh, from home clothes to hospital clothes, she just got. <laughs> so yes. I really want to know how to maybe the position of uh, a patient with PE. Yes. And um, what would be the uh, uh, it was is it is it necessary to do a CT angiogram CTPA uh, for a patient who has the classical signs of um, uh, pulmonary embolism? All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Nancy. Prof, comments. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, you can see what, what is a pulmonary embolism. It is mm -hmm. a very, very big clot here in a pulmonary artery. So if you have a, a, such a big clot, uh, you have no more uh, oxygenation of, uh, of, the, of the blood, of course. But first of all, you may have a, an acute heart uh, failure, a left, uh, a right heart failure, as that is responsible for a cardiac arrest. And uh, of course, uh, if you have a pretest, well, if you're uh, feeling, if you do uh, clinical uh, uh, examination, uh, if you, you believe that this patient have a pulmonary embolism, you don't have to think about anything else but seeing the clot. And how to see the clot is just making an imaging. The only way you have to make sure that the patient has the diagnosis is to see the clot. And today, seeing the clot is uh, ordering a CTPA. Now, the challenge here in our setting is we do not have CT angios widespread. Actually, there are fewer rather than readily available. And uh, mm -hmm. so the question is, how do we, can we get away? Potentially not, I mean, because the CT angio does pick up the PE. But when should you be thinking of a PE? And I just want to have a look at the algorithm that we use um, for the diagnosis of PE. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, share screen. Yes, share. Yeah. All right, so this is a pulmonary, again, also available in the algorithm on the website. Uh, this is a pulmonary embolism algorithm. And again, so pretty much starts off like the other one, patients with a chest pain, uh, presenting with chest pain, some potential risk factors, which may, may not be there. But some of the things you need to think about is, your patient, Nancy, had a DVT, so for sure, Right now, I'm thinking PE, and their collapse is PE-related unless proven otherwise. And so your high index of suspicion, um, and the main thing is shortness of breath. Most of the time, what we see is a tachycardia. ECG, I will not even discuss that, because most of the thing you'll see on an ECG is a tachycardia. So shortness of breath, acute, acute onset shortness of breath, tachycardia in a patient with... Uh, 
potentially was admitted or recently admitted recent surgery, has been on some contraceptive pills, history of travel, sometimes nothing, the history of malignancy. So your high index of suspicion is, and that's why this is also uh, a life-threatening cause of chest pain, is this patient will die as, um, as quickly as they present to you and you must be able to quickly think about it. So for the patient who is not crashing, so I will not speak on Nancy's patient just yet, but I will make a comment on this at the end. So for the patient that is not crashing and you're thinking PE, there is a set of criteria called years criteria. This came out, uh, I think a year or two back now, that has pretty much now worked down into our algorithm and I'll show you the discussion about it. So years criteria looks at three possible things. Um, so before we had clinical gestalt, we had well scores, we had all those things. But if you think, if you as a clinician think chest pain, I think PE. The next question you should be asking yourself is, does this patient have clinical signs of a DVT? So check the curve and all that, are they coughing out blood? And is PE the most likely diagnosis? So again, still boils down to what are you thinking? And if, and this is where your patient pretty much splits on the algorithm. So if they are stable, uh, hemodynamically stable, there's low probability, and they do not have any of these three criteria, there's a whole set of pulmonary embolus rule out criteria. Okay, and that again, you can read on the algorithm. Now your patient, uh, which is where Nancy, your patient came in is, are they at risk of cardiac arrest or hypotension? Um, allow me to quickly jump that because I want to bring that at the end, but assuming your patient is not going into a cardiac arrest, what the years criteria has brought in is the use of D-dimers. Uh, in terms of trying to work out um, if your patient is having a pulmonary embolus. And just, uh, well, let me just share this slide. Um, so this is the as criteria. Um, you have the three criteria, clinical DVT, hemoptysis, PE most likely. So if your patient has no years criteria, okay, and um, they, you do a D-dimers, then if you have uh, D-dimers are less than a thousand uh, nanograms per ml, then you've excluded a CT, you've excluded a PE without a need of a CTPA. If your D-dimers are above a thousand, then you need to consider getting a CTPA. If they are one to three years, uh, they have one to three years criteria, which is one of the three, and their D-dimers are less than 500, then PE is excluded. If they're more than 500, consider CTPA. Now, Prof, I want you to tell us more about D-dimers. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, one comment about uh, the year score and yeah. about uh, cardiac arrest and uh, pulmonary embolism. So regarding the year scores, uh, what is very interesting is that it has been uh, shown that in pregnant uh, female, that are that is a condition that increases uh, physiologically the concentration of uh, the dimers. Uh, the year score has been shown to be very efficient, which is yes. very interesting because it has decreased in the study that was released uh, last year. It has decreased by uh, about third, well one third the number of CTPA in pregnant women. So that is very interesting. And uh, regarding the problem of cardiac arrest uh, related to uh, pulmonary embolism, there is an old uh, study which is called uh, Study Troika. That was a European study uh, that also uh, included patients from the Canada that showed that in patients that have a cardi cardiac arrest related to PE, well, no chance to uh, recover, whereas you make uh, thrombolysis during uh, the CPR. Uh, so it's a very, very serious condition. And when there is a cardiac arrest, it's very difficult uh, to uh, take care of these patients and most of them will die. Of course, you can try to uh, resolve the, the clot using uh, uh, fibrinolysis, but we know that it's not so efficient. Uh, so yes. regarding, yes, uh, so maybe uh, you want to comment, Ben? Yeah, so again, so PE cardiac arrest starts CPR the usual way, but as Prof was mentioning, 
this is a patient where you thrombolize them, okay? So we've had successful stories where I work, where we've had patients presenting with chest pain, we thought it was PE, they actually crashed in the city machine, uh, but we were able to thrombolize them and they lived happily ever after. Um, so remember your H's and T's as part of your cardiac arrest. PE is one of them and so is uh, ACS and these patients need to be thrombolized. All right, Prof, some comments on D-dimers before I, yeah. Uh, and, and a very, very last comment about thrombolysis is that you have to make the thrombolysis uh, as soon as possible when the patient uh, is dropping the pressure. That's uh, the message. Yes. Uh, after it's too late, but when the, when the patient is hemodynamically unstable, it's time to make the thrombolysis. Yes, okay. before they crash. Yes, exactly. Yes. After it's, it's too late. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, PE and D-dimers. Uh, yes. So, what uh, are D-dimers? Yeah, D-dimers, uh, when you have a clot, uh, the physiological mechanism is to dissolve the clot. And uh, th this is a physiology. Uh, when you have a clot, the first thing that your body will do is to uh, make, uh, to cut it into a uh, a small pieces, and these small pieces are called D-dimers. Uh, among uh, the, the proteins that are released in the blood flow, you can measure uh, the concentration of D-dimers. So when you have a clot, which is not physiologically uh, normal, uh, there is an increase that can be a small increase of D-dimers in, uh, in the blood flow. And you can detect uh, very small clots with uh, D dimers concentration that can be measured in the blood flow. So when you don't have a, a very strong uh, a belief that your patient has a pulmonary embolism, you can uh, you have the possibility to measure D dimers. If D dimers are above the threshold, uh, your patient has a risk to have the pulmonary embolism, and you have to make a test to know if there is or not the clot in the pulmonary artery. All right. Yes. Thank you very much, Prof. So I think, yeah, for PE, the main thing is um, you need to figure out, again, your uh, wells, sorry, yeah, you sorry, no, your clinical suspicion, your years criteria, um, and here it's the one where everyone gets a D-dimer. And if you are, not low risk, okay? And maybe I just want to go quickly back on this. So uh, patient, if you meet any of the year's criteria, then you need to get a D-dimer done. There is a pulmonary, so if you do not have any year's criteria, then you may get away without doing a D-dimers if you go down what we call the pulmonary embolus rule of criteria. This is part of the algorithm, you can check out the algorithm. And it goes down uh, looking at different characteristics. So age above, age less than 50, pulse rate less than 100, SATs less than this, no hemostasis, no. So patients who have no years criteria and patients who does not pretty much meets all these criteria. So all this is they're less than 50, heart is less than 100, they're saturating well, no hemoptysis, no estrogen, no surgery, no priority, uh, no unilateral leg swelling, these patients, then your risk of PE is much less and you may actually discharge this group. But note, it is no years criteria and you meet all these criteria, okay? If you, if you do not meet all of them and only miss one, then you have to do your D-dimers, okay? You have to do your D-dimers on this group of patients, then use the years criteria to work them out, okay? Uh, we apologize, I think we're running just a bit uh, over time, so we'll probably make my last two comments um, and then invite the Biomario team to make a comment, then we can have our closing remarks at the end of it all. Um, for cardiac arrest, uh, key thing, cardiac arrest can be either chest pain and cardiac arrest, think heart attack, think pulmonary embolus. As you can see, this is a patient who presented with a STEMI, chest pain, and as they were doing the ACG, they went into a cardiac arrest. So be ready, 
okay? Patients with chest pain should not be managed in a cubicle in a corner somewhere. They could easily go into a heart attack and go, and go into a cardiac arrest. Similarly, with your pulmonary embolus, as a case from uh, uh, Nancy, uh, again, also worry about that patient uh, going into cardiac arrest. And uh, both patients, pretty much thrombolysis should be provided as soon as possible. I see someone had their hand up. Um, let me see. Yes, oh, they put their hand down again. Oh, Kevin, <laughs> you have your hand up. Maybe you can make your last comment before I invite uh, Dr. Sigay or Elojo to comment. Yes. Kevin, go ahead and mute yourself. Okay. Uh, um, oh, I, ha I just had a, a request. Yes. Uh, how can can we get to your your the slideshow the slideshare? Yes, the whole presentation will be available on the website. Uh, don't worry, we'll send you an email with all the links to that. All right, all right, Doctor. Okay, C yes, Doctor Sigay or Elojo, one of you again can jump in and tell us a bit about Biomario. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Wachira and um, Professor Klesens. I will just do a brief presentation on just um, within five minutes on um, our VIDA system. Then uh, Dr. Sige will come and, and do a closing, uh, a brief um, remark. Thank you very much and um, good evening all. Thank you for joining the session. It's a very, very interactive session, and um, I've personally gained a lot, so, and I'm sure that um, a lot of people have um, benefited from the presentation as well. So thank you. Um, I will just quickly go through our immunoassay system, VIDAS, in the next um, five minutes or thereabouts, then um, give um, Dr. Sige to make comments. On this. So, um, VIDAS um, is a fully automated system. It's based on um, the, um, um, the, electro, um, the alpha assay principle, providing high quality on demand test results. So, and there are three major um, VIDAS system, the VIDAS 3, which is the latest and um, of the highly automated um, of the VIDAS, then the mini VIDAS, which is um, adapted to small lab system and is uh, the VIDAS that has uh, the most widespread available in most labs. And then um, we have the VIDAS PC, which is the system with the um, highest throughput of the VIDAS system. And um, VIDAS, is a system that um, has large install base around the world. There are about 30,000 VIDA system available in labs around the world today in almost every continent of the world. And it's a system that is very robust and reliable. It has been in the market for more than 25 years. And it's um, a brand that you can trust. And with VIDAS, you can be sure that um, it's about quality. It provides high quality and it's a very cost effective system has a um, very for the reagents have long shelf life and um, the kits come in complete package so you don't have to um, you don't there are no hidden costs there are no additional um, consumables that you need to to buy so all the costs of the reagents are as it's stated there are no hidden costs and there's, um, with VIDAS, you're sure of quality and confidence in your results. It's a reliable platform. And for the emergency panel, among the other panels that we have, you have um, D-dimer, high-sensitive troponin, NT-pro-BMP, which um, some of the, especially D-dimer and um, um, high-sensitive troponin has been discussed during this um, presentation by Professor Klesens and Dr. Washira. And then um, we also have other panels, infectious disease panel, women health panel. And um, it's a unique single test um, concept. It's ready to use. The, the strips come in ready to use form. And there is no circulating fluid, no need for water, no contamination, because each section, you just um, you slot in um, 
one test strip into a section and uh, there is no need for batching. So there is no risk of contamination. So we write us to say it's one patient, one test, one result. And among the, um, the panels we have, like we mentioned earlier, there is the emergency panel where you have high sensitive troponin, you have NT pro BMP, you have D-dimer, and um, PCT and other tests are also available on the um, emergency panel. And there are also other panels, a total of about more than 70 um, tests are on the VIDAS, um, on VIDAS. And among them, now the new kid on the block is the um, um, VIDAS SARS CoV 2 IgG, IG, um, IgM, that's a serology test for COVID 19, is now available on VIDAS. So for VIDAS, we'll say, why is it um, a, a system that is convenient for your setting in your um, emergency um, clinic? It's very easy to use. It's easy to, be, it's easy to train within one day. Staff or yourself can be trained to um, handle your VIDAS system. It's very flexible. So you have sections. And when one section is in operation, you can still, you can still um, put your tests as they arrive on a, a, a section that is available, is always ready to use 24 seven. It's cost effective, hidden costs, low maintenance, there's no weekly or daily maintenance that is required. It's a very robust system with mean time to failure of more than, um, mean time before failure of about three years, has large menu, about 70 tests, and um, time to result for the, especially for the emergency test is within 20 minutes, you get your result out and it's quantitative results. So to summarize, in summary, um, it's, VIDAS has a unique concept. It's one patient, one test, one result. It's easy to use. It's random access, it's available 24 seven. So when one um, section is working, you can also, if you have an emergency, you can use um, the other section while one is running. It has high um, calibration stability. There's no daily or weekly maintenance that is required. It's a reliable system, robust, three years, um, about three years mean time before failure. So you know that your downtime is very low. Has, um, the kits have long shelf life and it comes in small sizes of 30 to 60. So well adapted to small and medium lab, lab, lab setting. And you guaranteed fast and reliable result. Like I said, most emergency results come within 20 minutes. It's just load and go. So, and it's a very flexible system, single test ready to use, like new, like I mentioned earlier, and you can do um, different tests simultaneously. So it's very ideal for emergency setting. And like I mentioned earlier, these are the um, three um, major systems, platforms that we have, the mini Vidas, um, the Vidas PC, which has um, a higher throughput, and the Vidas 3, which is um, very automated, highly automated. So, and um, it's a very, it's a system you can trust. It uses the enzyme link fluorescence assay method, and it's a very, very um, robust and worldwide acclaimed um, uh, um, platform that is available in every continent of the world. And today, if you think um, your lab setting will benefit from um, VIDAS, which I think so for most small to medium um, uh, lab and clinic um, settings, you can communicate with um, the BioMeru team in your country. And we have various options that um, will help to um, to, to provide you to, to make um, VIDAS available to you. So if you discuss with them, there are various options and they let you know which options are available that, will, that can help you have a VIDAS in your clinic or your lab. But thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you very much, Elojo. Hold on, Dr. Sige, to quickly yes. make um, a brief um, comment. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Eliojo, um, for that presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Kiplan Sike from Biomirio, the Medical Affairs Manager. 
And first of all, I'd like to thank all the participants for this, uh, for their time to participate in this uh, session today. And of course, to thank uh, Dr. Washira and Professor Klassens for moderating. Um, I know it was such a short time to try and cover two really interesting topics, and I still see that we have a couple of questions. So I don't know, Dr. Ashira, if you want to, first of all, tackle one or two of them, the burning ones, uh, before I make some closing remarks, or what do you suggest? All right, so I've answered most uh, on the side. So in, uh, for Leandro, the D-dimers in a setting where you don't have access to a CT, then acts as a triage tool as to who needs to be referred for a CTPA. So in a setting where you don't have CT, at least try and see if you can get D-dimer. I know if you don't have CT, chances are you don't have D-dimer, but I'm guessing maybe D-dimer is a cheaper investment. Um, though, so, and that helps you then triage patients who need to go for CT. Um, and um, in terms, John is asking about guidance on bare minimum for a facility to be able to give fibrinolytics. Um, the, the, I wouldn't say there's a bare minimum because fibrinolytics in this situation would be life-saving. So it can be given in any setting, but the patient where you do not have access to critical care, then the patient should be immediately referred to a critical care service because of time where heart muscle, brain, and all this are time limiting and in cardiac arrest, time is a factor. Fibrinolytics can even be given in an ambulance um, as long as the patient is headed to a critical care setting. So that would be my take on that one. Any setting, even a health center can give fibrinolytics, but the patient should be quickly in, uh, the system should be able to quickly transfer the patient to a proper center that would be able to manage the potential complications that may come in with the fibrinolytics and the problem that the patient has uh, on that, yes. Uh, maybe yeah, it's just yeah, a yeah, 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 Maybe, maybe, yes, maybe I just comment that. Yes. Uh, if I just have a comment on that, uh, go ahead. Most most patients do not have a uh, pneumodynamically instable state, and most patients with uh, uh, high risk of uh, pulmonary embolism have normal pressure. Uh, so what you have to do is to give these patients that may have a pulmonary embolism anticoagulation, efficient anticoagulation. You have to be, of course, very careful when you use thrombolysis. Uh, it's, well, it's very tricky. Your question is very tricky. Uh, however, most of patients that uh, high risk of pulmonary embolism will have a pulmonary embolism. 60 to 70% of these patients will have a pulmonary embolism. So giving them some uh, anticoagulation is, is a good way to answer a part of your question, but fibrinolysis so tricky. And remember, it's not, it's not everyone who's getting the fibrinolysis. It's patients who are hemodynamically unstable and patients in cardiac arrest. So do not give fibrinolysis uh, to everyone, okay? So it's patients who are hemodynamically unstable and cardiac arrest. So they should be getting the pulmonary, the, um, the, sorry, the fibrinolysis. All right, thanks. Uh, I see Marion, you have your hand. I'll ask, allow you to ask the question, then Sige, then we, we wrap this up. Go ahead, Marion. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you for the good discussion. So just to make a comment, PE for me has been more common than AMI. I think I see about five to one. So my question is mostly about emergency care, the pre-hospital and the A&D, and I think someone had asked it earlier. What are the emergency measures that can be taken while the patient awaits diagnosis, particularly for pulmonary embolism? What are some of the things that can be done in the ambulance and at the A&E? Mm. All right, Prof, you want to go ahead? Yes, yes. Uh, maybe I uh, answered part of the question just before. Uh, if you're a pre-test, if before you have a D-dimer test or if you have a D-dimer test positive, and uh, that you feel that your patient has a pulmonary embolism. Or if you don't have the D-dimer test, but even you feel you have a, a strong feeling that your patient has a pulmonary embolism, you should make the give the treatment, and the treatment, the first treatment, is anticoagulation. Because most patients will recover uh, by their own fibrinolysis. Remember, D-dimers are the product of fibrinolysis, endogen, endogenous fibrinolysis, and uh, so, for those patients, you begin the anticoagulation therapy. If uh, the pulmonary embolism is ruled out, anticoagulation will be stopped. 
if uh, it is uh, ruled in, well, you will have given the good uh, treatment without any major risk. All right. Um, and the thing, just Marion, also, the main thing about these patients, and uh, for patients where you're thinking heart attack and pulmonary embolism, especially in your pre hospital setting, apart from your ABCs, making sure that if their saturations are less than 90, you're giving them oxygen, um, set up your IV accesses. If you have access to an oxaparin, the clexin, and that, you can start that. But I think the most important part is be ready to defibrillate. Oh, sorry, not, well, defibrillate or be ready to start CPR on this patient. So ideally, you should be connecting them to a defibrillator uh, or to a monitor to monitor them because their chances of going into cardiac arrest are extremely high. So this is a patient you need to keep an extra eye on and transfer them also in a pre-hospital setting. Take them to a hospital that can do something, okay? Because again, time is of essence. There's no use of picking up a patient with a let's say a patient you think of a, has a heart attack and taking them to a health center that has nothing. Okay, yes, you give them the aspirin, the ambulance, but you should take them to a hospital that can provide care for this patient. Uh, a lot of times what we are seeing uh, is patients have done a bit of a dance around, around the city before they end up in our setting and they just keep moving from facility to facility where no treatment or uh, you take them, for example, Taking a patient with a heart attack to a facility that has no ECG machine is pretty much delaying care for this patient. Taking a patient you think has a pulmonary embolism to a facility that has no CT, for example, or at least D-dimers that has a starting point, is delaying care. So time to definitive care, if we can reduce that, then there's a higher chance of your patient surviving. So you, we need all to know which centers have CTs, which centers have thrombolysis, which centers have uh, cath labs and triaging these patients to these centers. Um, I think that would be the best thing you can do for your patient in a pre-hospital uh, setting. Um, Dr. Sigay, final comments, then I'll just give the final slide up. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oshira. And, um, and also, like I mentioned earlier, just uh, Big thank you to all the participants who've uh, kept it until late to still be in the session. We appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate our panelists, um, facilitators, uh, Professor Klassens, all the way from Monaco, as well as uh, Dr. Oshira uh, from right here in Kenya at Aga Khan Hospital. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues at Biomirio, um, who some, so including Eleojo, who has made a presentation, and also the team at Emergency Medicine Foundation. Just want to reiterate that. Bimery is a diagnostic company, and as we've seen from Elojo's presentation, we are very, uh, our main focus is to develop solutions that can help uh, you support patient care wherever you are. And for obvious reasons today, we focused on the elements of, of um, D-dimer and high-sensitive troponin, uh, which are solutions we have. And we know the settings are varied across the country and across even uh, several uh, other countries that could be dialing in. But the idea is we should always remember that diagnostics are the window, are the eyes that open up the clinician's uh, uh, path towards a better diagnosis for the patient. You know, without diagnostics, there's, you know, medicine is blind. Um, definitely the, the biomarkers are not the only thing that we are looking at. It's a holistic patient management. And the presentations by Dr. Oshin and Dr. and Professor Klassens have been really insightful in opening our eyes to these common conditions that we see um, in our hospitals every day. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to continue collaborating with us. As you can see, we don't just make the solutions. We're also keen on medical education, uh, such as uh, events such as this, and we'd like to continue collaborating with you uh, wherever you're working. So please feel free to reach out to us in our office here in Nairobi and also through um, other channels. So I think with that, I'll just hand over back to Dr. Ashira and uh, wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. All right, so this is a take home slide. Uh, maybe I'll give, I'll just put it up and ask Prof. Classens to make some last comments and then I can make my last comments and then we can call it a day. Go ahead, Prof. Okay, so uh, thank you so much to uh, invite me for this uh, panel. Uh, we should have been in the same room. We know that, however, because of COVID-19, it has been impossible 
However, thank you again. Uh, my very last comment uh, will be about collaboration and uh, what we should do uh, together. Uh, first of all, is, uh, it is very important that uh, when you have uh, a solution in your lab, you have to use it in the best way. So you have to collaborate, you clinicians, with the biologist, but also with the radiologist and all the, the other stuff to make a network that will help the patient and uh, have a good diagnosis, as uh, Dr. Sigay has just told, because without diagnosis, there is no treatment. So uh, please uh, meet your biologist, know what you have as a tool, make an algorithm that will be your algorithm to help your diagnosis with a strategy combining both uh, clinical and biological tools and this will help you uh, making earlier and better diagnosis it will improve patient's outcome and uh, we did not talk about that but it will make uh, a gain for the hospital and this institution ben uh, thank you very much prof um so my slide is so you take a message Get an ECG done for your patient who comes with chest pain. And the key thing is, are you having a STEMI or a STEMI? If you have a STEMI, get aspirin, cath lab, thrombolysis. If it's not a STEMI, get aspirin and do your troponins in an appropriate time. Please be very conversant on the time issues. Uh, where your patient you're thinking is having a pulmonary embolus, uh, if there's no years criteria, then go through the pulmonary embolus rule out criteria. If they do not meet all the criteria, then you need to get a D-dimers and then uh, differentiate that. If they have any of the years criteria, get a D-dimers and you saw the cutoff. For both of these cases, please get ready for cardiac arrest. So if the patient has chest pain and goes into cardiac arrest, of course, initiate your CPR and consider thrombolysis during CPR. We've done this several times and patients do come back to life after thrombolysis. All right, uh, again, thank you for um, bearing with us the extra time that we took and we really appreciate you guys uh, joining us today. Um, there is a feedback form, I'll put it on the chat. Please give us your feedback and this will also be sent throughout to you on email. Your CPD points will be available on email um, uh, for those who do get CPD points through the doctorate online system. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for Bio Mario for sponsoring this. And uh, Prof, good to see you again. Uh, it's been a while since we were together. And uh, all the best. Um, and to everyone, have a good night. And thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye, Ben. And thank Bye. you to the audience again. Bye. I, I can allow everyone to unmute. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Hey. Bye. 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 That was great, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, let me end this session and we'll keep in touch with email. Right. Bye. Hello, Joe. Keep. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you again. Dr. Ashera. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Clessens. All right. Bye, guys. Yeah. Okay, bye. Right. Thank you. See you next time. In